culture does make a difference in the leaders of an organization or a company actually have to align their decisions strategically with what people will tolerate at any given time. And understanding and adapting to the local cultural uh, environment is very important in any international business. Cross-cultural literacy traditionally refers to understanding how cultural differences across as well as within countries can affect how businesses practice. These differences create a common bond among people. Numerous values and norms exist in these cultural systems that can affect international business, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the environment. And cultures can and do evolve over time. So culture is defined as a system of values and norms that are shared among a group of people uh, and that when taken together constitute a design for living. But a simple definition of culture is that the way things are done around here. So around here for me means the United States, right? And more specifically in South Florida. But even in the United States, the South Florida culture might be a little bit different than the West Florida, than the North Florida or other states within the US. So even within South Florida, we have the Haitian culture, uh, which is combined with the traditional American culture. Then we have the Latino culture. And then within the Hispanic culture, we have more specifically the Cuban culture, for example, and maybe the Venezuelan culture, which are all speaking uh, English, but nonetheless, there are going to be some differences among them. So, but nonetheless, we can simply define culture as the way things are done here, which applies to national cultures as well as to organizational cultures. So culture, society, and nation states do seem to have some sort of relationship or impact or influence on one another. The relationship between a society and a nation state is not strictly one-on-one. -on -one. Nation states are political creations. So in other words, certain dominant personalities or powerful characteristics uh, of individuals tend to have more influence than on them than others. So if we think about Cuba, we can automatically think about the Fidel Castro, right? He was the powerful leader for a long time, right? And his influence obviously is gonna stay there for a long time as well. A nation can have several cultures and a culture can embrace several nations and can be different levels of culture within a country. Culture norms in value systems uh, can be studied among these different traits. What if social culture was language, education, economy, or the philosophy of the economy and the philosophy of politics? What if we look at it from a democracy perspective or where we're looking at it from a capitalism perspective, which we use here in the US. But obviously even within the US, not everybody believes in capitalism. Not everybody believes in democracy. You know, sometimes we feel as though, okay, we need to be a little bit more leaning toward communism or socialism to help the less powerful or the less um, well off. So if we don't do it, then obviously they become a burden to society. So a person or millions of individuals do not have health care and we don't provide them health care at the uh, affordable rate, then eventually they become sick and they end up in the hospital, which uses our tax money, right? So it's better to basically have a good health care system that is affordable by those who are not financially well off. But then some people consider that to be socialism. But obviously the idea here is to be responsible citizens whether we practice capitalism or socialism, regardless of the philosophy, we wanna take care of everybody in the community. Everybody's a human being, everybody has rights and privileges uh, that should be afforded to them. Ultimately, a culture forms when people's behaviors as a result of the various influences become ingrained in people's daily activities, patterns, and ways of doing things. Sometimes in corporate arena, we call this brainwashing. But obviously it's not brainwashing. A corporate culture is usually inculcated into the minds of employees during the orientation and then on a socialization process uh, as long as they stay in the company. The longer you stay with a company, the more likely that the culture is ingrained in your brain, right? And we do things automatically without consciously thinking about them. 
So while factors such as social structure and religion do influence the values and norms of a society, the values and norms of that society can influence social structure as well as religion as well. So in a way, there's this interdependent relationship between all these uh, various factors that are forming our cultures. I like this definition from Gert Hofstede, uh, where he said that the culture is the collective programming of the mind, which distinguishes members of one human group from another. Culture in this sense includes systems of values and values are among the building blocks of culture. Now your textbook's definition is different from this, right? But ultimately they all say the same. But the reason I like, and most people actually cite uh, this definition because it was initially published in his book in 1980, and then in 1984, and subsequently in many other versions of his textbook, as well as journal articles. The reason it's you know, caught on is because it does describe programming of the mind. So if the mind is programmed like a computer program, it's gonna continue to do the same thing over and over and over again. Now, if the program or the input is wrong, that means we're going to make a lot of judgments based on stereotypes, biases, prejudices, and misinformation. So then we would have to reprogram that. So what are your thoughts regarding Hofstede's definition of culture? Do you like it? Does it make sense? Or is it outdated? I think it makes sense because typically like the programming of the mind happens when like a child is raised in a certain cultural group. So like for instance, um, I know that in Latin America, like they teach the, like typically like most Latin American countries like Colombia, they're Catholic. So they typically try to raise their children with like Catholic values and like always being good with your neighbor and things like that. And then, but then again, in South America, like different countries are different in regards to like for instance, um, the Ameri Ameri Indian populations that have different cultural um, determinations, like the Peruvian Incas behave differently than the Colombian Indians that live in the Andes that are Chipchas. So it really does, um, the definition part about the program of the mind definitely does play into a role. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, so those are good points. Uh, yeah, I, Professor, thought... I agree with everything Jonathan said. It was very well said. And I was just like imagining now, like how long does it take to establish a new culture in a place, you know, to change and switch? Like, I, I don't know this number. Like, if you know, like I will research it later. Like, for example, we have something and to change these people and then make them think like something else, you know, because for example, I'm going to give an example. In Brazil, we are dealing like something, uh, we are very polarized at this moment. We have like literally half of the population who are like far right, and half of the population who are more uh, far left, you know? And then one thing that like the, the people from the left, they are working, is that like they go into like the universities and, and high schools to build these people up. So like now like this new generation of high school university students, they are becoming more far left because that's where they've been focusing. So like, I'm just wondering how long does it take to establish like something new in a place? You know? Right, right. That that that's the one million dollar question, right, <laughs> for all of us. But culture, this is a challenge because once it's established, it's very, very difficult to reprogram it. So think about you know, for the past forty years, as Americans, we've been involved in the culture of Haiti, right? Haiti is a very small country, about six hundred miles away from Florida, here, right? But tonight, if you watch the news, for example, they're saying Haiti is in crisis. Regardless of how much we do, even though it's a very small country, nonetheless, we cannot influence them to become democratic. So unfortunately, the crimes and the militias and the warlords and the gangs are taken over once again. So if Haiti is going through that and we cannot bring positive changes in Haiti, uh, being a powerful neighbor for them, you know, how difficult is it to change the culture? It's very difficult. But nonetheless, globalization do give us some uh, uh, theories that there's some convergence of cultures coming together in some respect. Technology is helping with this. 
but others are saying that there's actually divergence, which means we tend to cling on to our own cultural uh, norms despite the efforts of globalization. So sometimes it's because of fear, because if I'm a Haitian, I don't want my language, my customs and norms to be washed away over a generation. So, so th those are the challenges. And also there's some forecasts from experts that say that 90% of the world's languages will go away over the next 100 years. So if you're speaking Spanish, you say, well, Spanish is not going to be one of them because the majority of people in the world speak Spanish. If you're speaking English, you say English is not going to go away. If you're speaking Mandarin in China, you say, well, Mandarin is not going to go away. But if you're speaking a language that's only speaking that's only spoken by 10, 15 million people in the entire planet, you get worried a little bit. They say, wow, if the language goes away, the culture goes away, and the nuances and the norms and the mores associated with that culture will go away. So you want to cling on to that and hold on to it. It doesn't mean you don't want your children and uh, your future generations to speak Spanish, Mandarin, and English, majority languages, but you also want them to retain the, 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 the grandparents' culture and language as well, so they can hold on to those nuances that have been developed for hundreds and thousands of years in the past. So it's not easy to change a culture of the country, but it is much easier to create a culture for a new organization that is a global organization, let's say. So if you're starting an organization, you as the founding leaders of that organization can form the culture and then establish that culture. But changing even organizations' cultures that are established is very, very difficult. Oftentimes it requires a very powerful leader to come in and then rule with an iron fist to change it. So was saying that cultures can be differentiated based on four dimension initially. So he had four dimensions at the first place, which was individualism, uncertainty, avoidance, power distance, masculinity. And then in 1990, he added a fifth dimension, which was time orientation, short versus long orientation. And then in 2010, he added indulgence versus restraint. So what he's saying is that some cultures seem to be on one side and other cultures seem to be on the other side and other cultures are somewhere in between. So dominantly each nation will have, will be leaning toward one or the other. As Americans, the American culture in general, are we more individualistic or are we more collectivistic? In America, individualistic. Individualistic. Okay, so now um, if you look at within the American culture, we are more individualistic, true. If you look at it within the subcultures in the US, are African Americans more individualistic or collectivistic compared to the traditional white European population in the US? I would say they're more collectivistic. Now, right, now we're comparing them to the white population, not necessarily to um, Africans in Africa, right? So these are black Americans who are born and raised here and their parents in you know, previous generation probably were born here as well. So they're likely to adapt the national values of the American culture, but still there's the tendency because they have been a minority group and discriminated against most often, they tend to cling on to the collective nature of the family or the group in general. So they tend to be more collective in nature compared to the white population. What about the Hispanic population? How, where are they? Are they more individualistic or collective compared to the traditional white American population? I would say definitely collectivistic. Exactly. So it, it's not just your view and my view, right? It's when you look at the textbooks, they tend to identify all the subcultures within the U.S. as being different than the dominant culture, which is the traditional white European that migrated, you know, to the U.S. So uh, I, again, even if you look at a Chinese subculture, 
in all the minority cultures that have come to the US, even they came generations ago, they tend to retain or maintain some of their own traditional values. Are we as Americans in general, more low, low power distance or high power distance in America? Where do we fall on this second dimension? So power distance is basically how approachable your bosses would be, for example. In the US, we tend to approach our bosses more openly compared to many other cultures. So we're considered to be low power distance. When it comes to achievement orientation or nurturing, so he originally called this masculinity versus femininity. So we tend to be more achievement oriented culture. And this is where we get criticized quite a bit compared to the Europeans where people say the Americans are workaholics, right? We focus on work, work, work. And sometimes we never get a chance to actually talk with our family member, members or enjoy a meal in a long period of time. You know, we tend to basically be comfortable with the fast food culture or eating fast, which is not healthy for us, right? And then uncertainty avoidance, uh, high or low, we tend to be low uncertainty avoidance. In other words, we're not like the Chinese culture or the Japanese culture where uncertainty is avoided at all costs. They don't take as much risk where in the US we do take risk. And finally, the short versus long-term orientation, where do you think we fall on this category as Americans? Are we short-term oriented or long-term oriented when it comes to our decisions? Professor, I believe like Americans are very short-term oriented, especially when it comes about finance. And especially because like the it's it's the same thing that we say because they are so individualistic they want like consume so much I feel like an Amer and that's like I, I have a lot of friends who work in finance and they say Gabriel when America can have everything but not have anything at the same time <laughs> because if he makes like if he's if a, a person makes like uh, close to six digits he can basically have any car he wants like live in a very good place but like nothing actually is he is in the paper you know and then like, he's like uh just like losing his job away of missing like everything pretty much right right that's a very good example thanks to your friend and thank you for mentioning that that's very true yeah we are very short-term oriented decision makers uh, as 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 a culture unfortunately and the culture of the u.s has been formed right over 200 years so we're not talking about the Native American culture. We're talking about the traditional American culture, which is only 200 years old. So during these 200 years, we work, we work, we work, we make decisions for the immediate benefit without looking at the long term. So sometimes we make decisions that are good for short term, but very damaging in the long term, like hurting our relationships, our family, our brothers, our sisters, because we want immediate profits and so on. So. That's why we are sometimes um, unfortunately criticized. Maybe it's deserved in some cases. So we do need to balance our lives. In the last uh, four or five years and decade, actually, we see more focus on balancing our professional lives with personal lives as well. And in the well-being and the health of employees is a focus actually in American corporations nowadays. So these are the five as of 1990, but he also came up with a sixth dimension, right? The sixth dimension was indulgence versus restraint. So that is as of 2010, he added this. So his model went from four dimensions to six dimensions of culture. Culture, He said that cultures can be differentiated. So in 2010, again, Hofstede said that some cultures are, are indulgence oriented, some are restraint oriented. So indulgence, is a trait related to relative happiness based on instant gratification. Restraint is a cultural trait based on regulating and controlling behavior according to social norms. So in Dalgian societies, you see perceived happiness, life in control, positive emotions, basic needs are satisfied like in US, UK, Australia, and Chile, for example. In restraint culture, you see short-term happiness has less value. There's a sense of helplessness, less likely to remember positive emotions. Basic needs are not always met like China, Egypt, Romania. Even the Arabic cultures often fall in restrained culture and the Indian culture falls in restrained area. 
So indulgence cultures tend to focus more on individual happiness and well-being. Leisure time is more important. There's greater freedom and personal control. In restrained culture, positive emotions are less freely expressed and happiness, freedom and leisure are not given the same importance. So you and I in the US culture and the American, American culture do become socialized with indulgence. Even though we might come from minority groups in the US or from foreign cultures, Nonetheless, the longer you live in the U.S. culture, the more indulgence oriented you become. So an example of this is the fact that we tend to take more vacations. Sometimes our car is not paid off. You know, we borrow, we buy a car on borrowed money from the bank. Instead of paying that off, we say, oh, I deserve a vacation. So we spend $3,000 on a vacation for a week. So, but, but, you know, if you're from a restrained culture, you say $3,000, I'm not spending that on vacation when I haven't even paid my car off yet. So we let go of the vacation. We might even work a second job during those three weeks of vacation to make more money, but at least we pay off the car. So th this is the norm you see with many foreigners coming into the U.S., this is the only way or the best way to get ahead because they are inculcated, they're socialized in a restrained culture, so they forego the indulgences that a traditional or average American would uh, take advantage of. So nonetheless, you can differentiate cultures based on those. So indulgence cultures tend to place more importance on freedom of speech, personal control, while in restrained cultures, there is a greater sense of helplessness about personal destiny. All right, so Hofstede's results in your book, it's mentioned that he created an index score for each dimension from zero to 100. So Western nations tend to score high on individualism and low on power distance. Latin American and Asian countries emphasize collectivism and score high on power distance. Japan demonstrates strong uncertainty avoidance in high masculinity. So masculinity, he also calls it achievement orientation. In other words, you keep working, work, 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 because that's a symbol of success for the Japanese and also for us in America. When we compare that with the Europeans, they see things very differently, right? They tend to have more of a balance. So Gert Hofstede's work is the leading research on culture, but has received some criticism. It assumes a one-on-one -on -one correspondence between culture and nation state when many countries have more than one culture like US and, and other uh, cultures as well. Research may be culturally bound sometime and cult research focused on a single industry sometimes can influence. So his initial research was on IBM with 60,000 people, but since 1980, now he has a lot more countries in a lot more industries. So that criticism is no longer um, founded because it was basically mainly on the IBM, which was from 1980. Uh, Gabriel, you have a question? No, Professor, just going to mention what you recently mentioned that when we look at this, we see like a lot of this, even as sometimes we have a little bit more like of individualistic in our life, sometimes more collectivist moments. And in my perceptions, like all about creating like a, a balance, right? So you can like be not be too much on one side focus, but not being in the other and like create this balance that would be healthy for you and then like for your family and people around you as well. Right, right. And, and that goes back to your question earlier, you know, how easy is it to change uh, the culture of an organization or a country? Obviously, ch changing the culture of a country would be extremely difficult. But organization, if you're a powerful leader, you have a lot of influence, maybe not as many employees in the organization, it's easier to change that. But we have more change, obviously, over our family, like you said. So maybe we can take advantage of within the family to have a happy life or a sustainable life as a professional employee, whether we are in America or in Japan or in Venezuela or in Cuba or anywhere. Hopefully we can be more sustainable and hopefully we can do the same thing for our employees to bring about positive changes within the workforce for us. And, and so, you know, if you look at the immediate um, uh, era in the U.S. over the past two decades, you know, we've had uh, people like Obama, we've had people like Trump, for example, 
two different approaches to politics, right? Each of them have their own influence. So long-term history would tell basically which one had more of a positive impact on the political culture of the American culture. But in the past uh, four or five decades, for example, we can look at people like Gerd Hofstede, uh, I'm sorry, not Gerd Hofstede, but because he's an academic uh, leader, but people like Dr. Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, right? Those are people who also influenced the world on a global scale about nonviolence, for example. So, but yeah, you're right. We can certainly, as leaders, uh, try to influence ourselves, our own family members, our departments, our teams, our organizations, and hopefully that leads to a bigger scope or influence in the long term. So as a group, if you want to, you can find out the differences in values for the countries you focus on, one country, or compare your country with two or three different um, countries. Um, you can go to Hofstede website online and actually put in the country. So for US, when I put in US, I get this scale on the six dimension. So you can copy and paste this graph and you can put it on your paper, make it figure one. So that would be figure one. And you basically cite that you got it from Gert Hofstede's website. So again, you choose the country and it tells you up to date. Now these data points are based on thousands and thousands of data that have been created by researchers by Gert Hofstede from around the globe. So it's not just Gert Hofstede himself, but all researchers at a master's level, doctoral level, and professors who constantly do research in different countries. And I've done research, for example, with my PhD students uh, who were getting their doctoral degrees in Southeast Asia, like in Vietnam, in Malaysia, in Thailand, Afghanistan. Afghanistan, actually very few because uh, it's been in war. But Pakistan, for example, does have a lot more data points compared to many other nations in Asia. So you can do this and you can also compare US with, for example, others. So in this case, I compared China, Iran, and Pakistan, but you can also add US. So you can see the scores side by side. And so if you're looking at two countries next to each other, or if you're looking at, let's say, ASEAN community, which is, I believe, 11 uh, countries, you can put all of them and see how they score on power distance on individualism. But for US, it would be easy because it would just be US, Canada, and uh, in, in, in Mexico for NAFTA, if you're comparing the three cultures and can they really do business uh, based on uh, that the deal that was signed uh, on NAFTA. The USA and Europe are similar in size, population, standard of living, and lifestyle. But as an American myself, after spending more than one year of my life in Europe and visiting every single country on the continent, there are some major cultural differences that need to be addressed. Bonjour! Disclaimer, I know it's impossible to group Europe into one category. So these are general realizations that may not exist in every European country. Here are 18 cultural differences that Europe has over the USA. Second bourgeois and party. One, pay to use public toilets. It's not free to pee or do your business in public. You have to pay usually one euro to use the bathroom, even if it's just to wash your hands. Two, water is not free. When you order water in a restaurant, it usually comes in a tiny glass bottle and costs two to five euros. They love sparkling water too, so make sure to tell them you want still water. Can I get a still water please? Travel tip, carry around an empty water bottle and fill it up in sinks or public fountains. It's all purified. Three, every city has history. In America, we don't have much to talk about before the 17th century. In Europe, some castles are 500 years older than the US even became a country. Four, they drive less. Public transportation is everywhere and efficient in Europe, and most cities are pedestrian and bike friendly. There's really no need for a car, and gas is too expensive anyways. Five, sports are not a family affair. In the States, we pregame and drink beers and tailgate for sports games with our families and friends. In Europe, sports aren't such big events, except for soccer, which they love. Six, smaller food portions. This is the size of a normal meal in Europe, and this is a standard Coke. Also, ketchup is not free and comes in glass bottles. Seriously? Seven, cigarettes are fashionable. They aren't so looked down upon among Europeans either. I guess they don't have the D.A.R.E. program in Europe. In other words, smoking equals cool. Eight, they dress nicer. They don't just throw on basketball shorts, a university t-shirt, and sandals. Sup, dude? They always dress to impress. <laughs> and about those haircuts. 
Nine, they can speak multiple languages. It's not uncommon to meet Europeans who speak four, five, or six languages fluently. This beer is very good. This beer is all good. The beer is very good. And the beer is very good. The beer is very good. Ten, they recycle more. Metal cans, plastic, paper, bottles. Europeans recycle more and take better care of their environment. In Germany, the government incentivizes you with 25 cents for returning an empty bottle. Empty water bottles can make you rich in Germany. Many Americans seem to throw trash on the streets without thinking about the consequences. 11. Coins actually matter. Don't lose your euros. This handful of coins is 20 euros or 24 US dollars. If these were quarters, it'd be about three dollars. See the difference? 12. Toilets have two buttons. This makes a lot more sense, right? Big ones for poop, small ones for pee, to save a lot of water every flush. Also, bathroom sinks are tiny. Check for little kids. <laughs> 13. Electric cars. It's more and more common to drive small electric cars in Europe. Once again, better for the environment. And you can pull into these parking spaces and you charge it. It's so simple. 14. Fewer trash cans. I never had this problem back home, but in Europe, it always seems like there's a trash can every two miles. But believe it or not, the streets are clean. 15. Street signs are tricky. Can't find the street sign? Look on the building. It's usually there. 16. Dinner is an all-night activity. Expect to spend three or more hours schmoozing and eating with your friends at the dinner table. In the US, if we wait more than five minutes to get our check, we talk to the manager. Don't be in a hurry if you're going to dinner with Europeans. 17. They love the outdoors. You'll notice this by seeing tons of parks and outdoor cafes all over Europe. They love their leisure time and they don't use their phones as much as we do. 18. Longer vacation. Many European countries like France have six or more weeks of vacation or holiday as I call it. In the US, two weeks would be generous. So what do you guys think? Did I miss anything on this list? I'd love to know. We can thoughts. learn quite a bit and we also want to recycle but why is it taking us so much longer to get to that point to be sustainable to control climate in a positive way compared to the Europeans which seem to be much farther ahead of us. So Gabriel, you ask about cultural change. So if we can't even recycle as fast as we want to, even though most Americans do understand the value of it, but somehow we're not, you know, catching up with the Europeans. So they're ahead of us. Any other ones that you saw that um, make sense? And it's still valid, obviously. No, it's really funny to see, Professor, because I feel like the United States, it's their own word, you know, like uh, people here in America, they live as this is their own planet. And it's like very different from like pretty much everywhere in the world, you know, like you go to Europe, like you have like something very distinct from here. You go to Africa, Asia and South America. And it's just like curious to see, like even like Americas, they, I, I understand in this way that like they have this perception, like as them being like the whole world, you know, I'm not saying this is bad in all means, but. It's just funny. Th those are good points, obviously, and there are going to be other 18 other changes that you could easily cite that we can benchmark from other cultures, other countries, uh, and how they are different. Now, as Americans, obviously, uh, as the video also mentioned, we don't have a long history of established culture, so we can bring about changes more quickly compared to other cultures. But think about uh, the, the Europeans, for example, or Indians. Why is it that they cannot use capitalism the same way as we have benefited from it. Now, China is kind of interesting because they have a very strict control system by the government, but they have moved much faster than the Indians, right? Indians have a democracy culture, yet they cannot move their economy as fast as the Chinese. The Chinese, through power of the government, have been able to move faster in grow faster, get ahead, even though they're not using a capitalistic model like we do. I think there are learning points, obviously, from each of these countries and cultural differences. I would like for you to do, to, to, do, to, to see uh, Franz Trompenor also when you get a chance. So um, his material, he's also similar to Gert Hofstede. He also talks about cultural dimensions. I had a chance to see him actually in Orlando where he collected 6,000 data points about cultural dimensions uh, based on his book, Writing the Waves of Culture. So he says, the international manager reconciles cultural dilemmas. And I posted this link for you when you have time where he says, 
you know, riding the waves of culture, you know, why do we have so many crises around the globe? So he does a really good job of basically emphasizing in this video online. So see that. And then there are implications overall. So some of the managerial implications that companies must be informed about the culture of another nation when conducting international business on a global scale. We need to be mindful of ethnocentricity, which is the belief that superiority of one's own ethnic group or culture. So if we go to other countries with its ethnocentric mindset, unfortunately, that's going to work against us. You know, if you believe that your culture is the best and only culture and it should be duplicated in other areas, that automatically disqualifies you. That means you're prejudiced toward your own culture. And unfortunately, as Americans, we tend to, we have a tendency to do this and we want other countries and other managers, other workers to do things our way when in fact it may not be the best way, at least not in their culture, in the context of their culture. Maybe in the US it might work for us, but it may not necessarily work in other cultures. So be mindful of that. And uh, anthropologist Edward T. Hall knows that cultural differences in attitude to time can cause myriad problems. So in South Florida, oftentimes we say, are you talking about American time or Cuban time? But that's not just Cuban time. It's time basically that is experienced by many other cultures that is very different from ours. Time is not always a priority in many countries, right? So if you're half an hour late, no problem. The relationship still stays intact. But in the US, you're half an hour late, you get yelled at, you scream at, you may not even get interviewed because you were late half an hour, despite the fact that you might have had a really, really good reason for that. So anyhow, that, that's why Edward Hall mentions that. So adaptation can embrace all aspects of international firms operation in a foreign country. The goal for us to be cross-cultural, to be adaptable. Um, otherwise, unfortunately, we may not make good decisions on a global organization. Values and norms influence cost of doing business and the cost of doing business influence ability to establish a competitive advantage. The culture of modern Japan, for example, lowers the cost of doing business relative to Western cultures. Connection between culture and competitive advantage is important because it suggests which countries are likely to produce the most viable competitors. And it has important business implications for the choice of countries in which to locate production facilities to do business. So as Americans or as Europeans, why do we go to certain countries? Whether it's we look at the stability of the culture, maybe the closeness of the culture to our own culture, or the fact that their corruption perception index might be low. Um, th those are all implications for doing business on a global scale or for indirect investment. So, but hopefully each of you will be researchers in the future as well. Um, when you have more time, you publish, you write based on your own views. Thank you guys for attending last week and this week. And I wish you good luck in the class. And if you have questions, email me uh, or call me at the office. I have those office hours on Monday and Wednesday from 10 to 12. So usually I stay at the office for seven or eight hours. And then uh, you can call me at any time if you have questions. Awesome. Thank you very much, Professor, for this lecture, like uh, for all the knowledge that you keep bringing to us. Uh, I really like this area like uh, globalization, international. I believe a little bit because of my background. And it's been like a, a joy to start this class with you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Appreciate it. It's a good topic. Obviously, it's of interest to all of us. So I look forward to uh, seeing your presentations in a couple of weeks as a team and then looking at your research papers and article summaries individually. So I look forward to that. I enjoy it too because, you know, it's always a good reading because, you know, you focus on your own views and experiences, which is oftentimes different than mine. It's a different perspective and I look forward to that. All right. So you guys have a good night. Be safe and stay healthy. Good night.